1988, TSR released Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, an RPG based on, well, Buck Rogers. Now, while the game itself wasn't terrible, it did not take all that well for several reasons. First, there was no market for it. Nobody wanted it in comparison to the games that they did want out of TSR. And second, it was only made due to Lorraine Williams, who was running TSR at the time, having a stake in the rights to the character, a family thing. The sad thing is, if TSR needed a sci-fi setting that badly, they could have looked into what they had done before. They could have looked into Star Frontiers. Released in 1982, Star Frontiers was TSR's attempt at a space opera, but instead of being D&D in space, a problem that we had with the first Star Wars D20, it opted to utilize its own system that made it one of the more beloved of TSR's underdogs. Does it still hold up? Well, let's find out. Now I'm covering the base game for the bulk of this review, as there's no core book in the sense we're more familiar with in later games. Instead, we have the classic approach of a basic book at around 20 pages, a light read if a bit of a scrunched one. And I can't be too harsh on the game's presentation due to it being at the standards that TSR had at this time, with the kind of art flourishes one might expect from old school D&D. Bottom line, it's what you'd expect from the early days of tabletop gaming. This was 1982 after all. For character creation, we'll be referencing both the basic rules and the expanded one in parts. You'll see why I took this approach as we go through the process of making a sample character here in Robinson Kanai. Characters have four ability scores written in pairs, generated by four percentile rolls. In our case, we rolled an 84, 56, 65, and 95. Checking the ability score table, we get the following results for each pair. Strength and stamina 60, dexterity and reaction speed 50, intelligence and logic 50, and personality and leadership 65. This number is modified by the race of the character, in our case a human. They may increase a single ability by 5, which will do to strength to make it 65. While we may exchange points between abilities in this pair, up to 10 points per each pair, the 10 digit in reaction speed is written as our initiative modifier, in this case 5. We won't do any of the point exchanges in this particular example. Now for skills, we gain two skills at first level. Before choosing the skill in question, we have to select one of the three primary skill areas. Military, Technological, and Biosocial. In our case, we're going with Military. Thus, we gain a level in a Military skill and a level in one skill of any category. We'll be going with Melee Weapons and Psychosocial. For our starting credits, we'll have a standard pack of 50 credits to spend, which we'll be spending 30 on a sword and keeping the remainder as pocket money. Character creation is simple, which might be a deal-breaker based on your background. I know I've said that a lot, but it always bears repeating. That said, it is a bit clunky due to the difference between the basic and expanded books. I favor the expanded version, as the basic version of character creation is perhaps a little bit too basic for my tastes. I like having some variety in build, and just different dice rolls isn't a variety enough. Star Frontiers uses a percentile system. Obviously, you roll a d100 and compare it to one of your relevant ability scores. If the result is under the ability score plus or minus any modifiers, the action is a success. The d100 roll alone is simple enough, but where the possible issue may lie is where it's utilized. See, I've talked about unified versus segmented mechanics in the past, and Star Citizen is an example of the latter. While the percentile roll is the primary roll, not all the roles utilize the ability scores. In fact, the primary ones that do are the military skills. The remaining skills have a base percentage that varies from skill to skill, with a skill adding 10% per level. For example, in the Demolition skill, the base for setting charges is 30% and Diffusing is 50%. In some cases it's understandable, but I don't like how this divorces from the bulk of the ability scores. This setup is reminiscent of the percentile roles for Thieves in AD&D. In my opinion, that was a mistake. Star Frontiers is attempting to be a skill-based game with its expanded rules, but that requires an approach different from their bread and butter. While I could go further in regarding the sister game Nighthawks and how it handles starship combat, having this issue at the core is reflected in the rest of the matter. In my first ever review, I called Nostalgia the Sweet Poison. While I have a lot of fond memories of Star Frontiers from my early days, blame it on a lucky find at a half-price books when I was a little kid. 
but nostalgia alone isn't enough to make me recommend something. With this entry, TSR tried to branch out into SF, but they couldn't quite shake off some of their old habits. As such, the highest grade I can give the game is Caution. It's not a bad game per se, but the skill system is not aged gracefully, and it might not have enough character variety for some. There was an attempt to make a cleaned up version years ago, but that got cease and desisted by Wizard of the Coast. Now the original PDFs are available at DriveThruRPG, but I would require a significant amount of reworking in my not so humble opinion. I honestly think a Star Frontiers 2nd edition would have been much better received in 1988 than Buck Rogers was. It probably still would have gotten ruined by Lorraine Williams' meddling, but at least it would have been something better than go going with a game that nobody asked for. Next time, we'll be diving into TSR's foray into superhero role-playing, and more specifically, a spiritual successor therein. Brace for the chart, folks.